Hey guys, it's Rob Keats back today. I wanted to do a special video today based upon some of the research I've done the last two weeks. I think this may be the best research I've ever done for the channel uh, over the years and certainly uh, piggybacks on what I used to write about the last 12 years uh, across <clears throat> a lot of outlets online. Uh, this time, however, I really kind of outlay what I think is going to happen in the financial system and what the repercussions will be uh, for different participants and what's going to happen. And I think it's very valuable and beneficial to you guys because it'll help you prepare your invest, not only your investment strategy, but also how we're going to weather the economic storms that are going to come over the next several years as we enter the end of the current fiat-based debt, debt system, monetary system originally. Uh, springing forth from Bretton Woods uh, after World War II, and then also through 1971, where Nixon took us off the gold standard. So in other words, this is the, the end game or a, a large part of the end game for the current dollar system. Now, over the last two weeks, I've put out so much research and I've gotten tons of questions over this. And what I wanted to do is break out in, in like a Q&A segment some of the research that I had. So I'm gonna put some of the more popular questions that I've gotten over the content up on this video and I'm going to play some segments, replay some segments in bite-sized chunks to help explain it. I think this will answer a lot of the questions you guys have had. And I think this further, this information is so valuable that it needs a second viewing, uh, not only because there's a lot behind it, but because I wanna make sure that you guys ha have gotten it and are receiving the information as timely as you can because I don't think we have years and years and years before all of this is going to go down. And you'll see when you get into the research why I believe that. There's a ton of data suggesting that this could be right around the corner. Again, uh, I think this may be one of the most important videos I've ever produced, and I hope that you guys will view this information. It answers a lot of your questions. If you have more questions, put them down in the comments and on Twitter. I will have a couple of these uh, clips, shorter versions on Twitter as well to address that audience. And please put the questions down. If you have further questions, it may you know, help me do some additional research or maybe just bring you some answers on the next live stream we have next Tuesday. So appreciate you guys for sticking with the channel. Uh, it has been definitely a labor of love. I've loved doing it. It's a lot of work, but I think the information contained herein is extremely important. And I don't know that you're gonna get this everywhere to be honest with you. So thanks for tuning in guys. Stay tuned for a great Q and A session on last two weeks of content that I think is really gonna help you get your arms around it in a way that'll help you cement in your mind what your plans, economic and financial, are gonna be for the future. Thank you. Welcome to Gold Silver Pros, where you'll learn the ins and outs of the gold and silver markets. Searching for the best precious metals deal? Our affiliates are of the utmost trust, quality, and highest customer service in the industry. Shop with our trusted partner, Arc Silver. Access special deals on silver, gold, and platinum through our website or call 307 264 9441. It's got the most data, it's what people look at. That's determined spot price. So, even though spot prices are down, that's just derivative trading, that's just paper trading. It does not reflect the physical market. And I'm about to show you that. So, let's get to the physical. The most interesting part of this presentation beyond the fact that we know that the smart money front ran the Fed because they probably were told, to be honest with you, and had connections, is the fact that we've had an outflow uh, in the ETFs of gold and silver. And I'll get to actual fiscal silver and, and COMEX in a minute. But no, the reason there are so many withdrawals in gold and silver is people are taking the precious metal. They want to hold it in their hand. Okay, Let's look at the four-week uh, change in gold. COMEX and all the other ETFs down three main ounces. 1.9% just in the last four weeks. And look at this red coming off of COMEX, registered and eligible. So registered and eligible has fallen. So registered is the trading stock. Eligible is the private storage, which may be released for, released for trading, but it's a private transaction to do so. Both of those have come down. And COMEX itself, out of the 2.9 million ounces, 2 million in gold has come off the COMEX just in the last four weeks. Okay. What about silver? Same thing. Net net silver is down 21 million ounces. Okay. On the COMEX is actually up slightly, off registered slightly up on eligible, but overall down. So silver and gold are coming off the COMEX, they're going into strong hands. Why? Well, look, it's what happened to the market. The markets have crashed. And we know that the value of M2 money supply is crashing. 
So we know people don't want to be positioned in bonds and stocks, and they're not because they got out of it because we saw this chart in the spreadsheet, which shows they're getting out of everything. What they're doing is buying cheap gold and silver, right? They get cheap gold and silver. They keep the price down with derivatives because what does it cost you to hold a short futures position if you're a mega, mega bank? Not much. Okay. It's a percentage of the trade as a fee, right? Maintaining that position, but they're getting the actual fiscal off at cheap prices. Here's the warehouse gold stocks. You see the downtrending line since 2020, since the pandemic, gold's come off the COMEX, the total stockpile. What's happened to silver? It's come off the COMEX. Even more, more silver has come off the COMEX since silver squeeze than gold has come off in the same time frame. Gold is coming off more lately, but silver has come off more overall. What does that mean? I'm going to interpret that for you. Gold has come off more lately because there was more available. And so it, you had more time to get your gold off at cheap prices. Silver, there's less available as a percentage of worldwide output. And because it's used industrial and less is available in investment form every year. So the people went for silver first. That's why they pulled the silver first. That's why the silver reduction is much sharper than the gold reduction. But you're seeing them come to gold. And what did I say a few weeks ago? I said, silver's coming off the COMEX. Watch for gold coming off the COMEX. That signals the exit of the big hands from the derivatives market and gold and silver. Now it's going to be a slow exit, but they're going to get out. Okay. Why are they getting out? They want to get their gold and silver. They're preparing for what? The big crash. Okay. And remember when I said gold wasn't flowing off the COMEX as much as silver, but it started to look at this sharp little downtrend. They've started to go get the gold and the silver. How are they keeping the prices cheap while they do this, ladies and gentlemen? Well, if you look at the volume and OI of gold, you can see in the last few days, the volume's been up and it's been to the short side. How do we know we click on settlements on this CME gold data, which is presented on cmegroup.com under the gold tab. And we can see reduction in price. The dominant month right now is August of 2022. We know because as the most open interest of 387,697 contracts, and they settled at a price, an average price of 1763. Okay, this is today's numbers. We go back to the last trading day on Friday. Remember, Monday was July 4th. It was a holiday. The last trading day, there was heavy interest, 397,000, and they closed at 1801. Okay, that's dragging the price down. And again, these are derivative or paper trades. This is not physical. This is not physical. I'll show you physical in a minute. Here's Thursday's data. Well, it closed at 1807. So you can see the stair step down in gold. Well, how do I know this is all derivatives? Because it's the open interest on the COMEX, which is a paper contract. But if you look at the actual deliveries in gold, ah, 425 here, not very many. This is on Friday's data. Let's go to Thursday. Thursday had 343, not very many. Wednesday had 136. Now that's about 1,000 or so if you look at those three days, a little bit less actually, about 1,000. But look at the amount of open interest, 550,000. Open interest is 494 on the 1st of July. So out of 494,000 trades, only about 1,000 actually settled in fiscal. That's why we say the spot price is determined by paper. 99.9% .9 of its paper trading has nothing to do with the fiscal market. But what they can do is by going short, they can keep the price down and they can take the fiscal off. How are they taking the fiscal off? They're taking it off the warehouses here and here. Same thing in silver, open interest spikes up a little bit here. What are the settlements? Again, this is all paper trading. The dominant contract is September in silver. 117,000 open interest on today, Tuesday, July 5th. As you see right here, closing price, 19,121 on average. Well, let's go to last trading day, Friday, before today. Again, dominant contract, September, 116,000 open interest, close at 1966. Okay, we go back up to Thursday. Same thing, 114,000 closed down negative 3.86 at 23.5. So it's been falling on the paper trades, okay? Down 68 cents on Friday, down 54 cents from previous close. So what they do is they dump a bunch of paper on the derivative market, bring the price down. That's why gold and silver are trading down today. It's just paper trading to the short side. But they're taking the physical off the market. Why are they taking the fiscal off the market? Because in July of last year, Reuters, the mouthpiece, said all these central banks are going to contract. Let's go back and rewalk through this real, real quick, and I'll see if we have any questions. I'm going to do this like super, super fast. Reuters says all these central banks are going to retract. And again, here's all the detail. M1 and M2 don't retract until March. Let's get to the short-term charts. Until March, 
So that gives them three, you know, seven, eight months to prepare. Let's go and do this chart. So they got seven, eight months to prepare and pull out. Okay, what are they doing? They're pulling out. Let's go back to this chart where they've been pulling out. But if you go back to the longer term chart, I'm gonna show you the spreadsheet where it's been going on for longer. Go back to the spreadsheet. This has been going on for some time, all the way back to September and December for bonds. Again, just a couple of months after Reuters said, hey, this is what the central banks are gonna do. Okay, does this make sense? Am I painting the, painting the picture for you guys here? The overall aggregates are still up. You still have more M1 and M2 on reserves and currency and circulation, according to the Fed, but it's less affected because when you look at it deflated for inflation, the value of that M2 money stock has come down. So they needed to get out ahead of it. And by the way, the velocity has fallen off a cliff. They're not saving it. They're doing other, I mean, they're not spending it in the broad economy, buying goods and services or doing other things with it. It's part of the exit. It was never that money that was printed, mostly M1 to the commercials. Remember, commercial M1 is mostly commercial. That money that they printed went to the big commercial guys who, by the way, did not put it into the economy. You can see that here. They put it into other things while they're exiting the position. They're making themselves whole. In other words, the 2020 pandemic money spree by the Fed was a bailout of large institutions. It didn't help the broad public because why? This is the measure of them to money supply in the broad public. They got a lot less of it. OK, and it wasn't being spent by the people. They were just paying bills and stuff. They didn't get the majority of the money supply. It was the big guys. The CEOs exit out. People sell their 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 bonds and their stocks, massive ETF fund outflows. They take gold and silver off of the exchanges to where you see those amounts fall. And then they they do that cheaply because they're hammering the prices. You can see on the gold trade on the COMEX. It's not that hard. Ladies and gentlemen, put this all together. It did take some time for me to put it all together. So yes, one, it has to do with a reduction in the monetary aggregates. But more than that, it has to do with the broadcasting of Fed policy to large elites who got in the bailout of the money and then exited their positions, took the money, exited their positions, made their institutions whole while the rest of the people suffered because they didn't get the majority of the money. And the velocity of money fell. So even though velocity of money is falling, inflation can still go up. That's a misnomer. A lot of people tell you velocity of money has to go up for inflation to go up. It does not. Or, uh, current, so you know you have the current definition. I'm showing you uh, the, where I pulled the report from the quarterly report on bank trading and derivatives activities from the OCC, OCC.gov. And now I'm going to show you that actual report. Okay, so I'll get to page 34 in a minute. This is the Office of the Comptroller of Currency. You see the URL, you see my source is right off the government website and making this stuff up. This is for first quarter 2022. It is the latest one produced by the OCC. We're first going to go down to page 34, and this is the chart that I teased you guys on Twitter. Or no, it's not. We'll get to that in a minute. This is figure 10. When I said earlier that there are four banks that dominate the derivatives market, I'll show you which banks those are in a minute. But this is confirmation from the OCC that, yeah, four mega banks dominate all the derivatives in the U.S. market. That includes credit default swaps, mortgage-backed derivatives, interest rate derivatives, swaps credit default swaps, uh, all of the commodities complex, including the metals dominated by four, four, count them, four banks. This is from the OCC. This is not conspiracy theory. Four, and I'm going to show you because they tell you who they are in the next couple of slides. Where are they exposed? Credit derivatives, options, swaps, and futures. What do we talk about most of the time when we talk about the COMEX and how the spot price is determined there based upon the futures derivatives. We talk about futures and forwards. Guess what? The top four dominate. So not only have we seen it in the COT report that the top four banks dominate the commodities markets, specifically gold and silver, we see it in the office of the comptroller of the currency, a second confirming source, both sources from the government, okay? It's not me saying it, it's them saying it. Who are the four banks? Based on percentage, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citibank, Goldman. It's the top of each chart. If you can't see my cursor, JP Morgan right here, Bank of America, Citibank, Goldman own the majority of credit derivative. I'm sorry, just derivative risk, not just credit derivative, all derivative risk in the U.S. market and by nature of that, the global market, because it's all 
intertwined and invested in each other. When we say four banks determine the, the overall liquidity market for the banking system, determine the derivative pricing, not only for precious metals, but other things like mortgage-backed securities and things like that, we're not joking. It's in the office of the comptroller of the currency report that's been there for years. It's not conspiracy, okay? What's the next one I want to show you? Let's go to page 39, quarterly trading revenue. I want to show you how the banks are making a mint, on not just on the metals markets, but all the derivatives. Quarter one of 2022, they made $10,000 million. I believe that is $10 billion. Most of it was in orange, which is foreign exchange market. So trading the currencies. There's some in the equity markets, which is stock, some in the interest rate markets as interest rates rise, uh, some in commodities, which would include gold and silver. That's the red. You know, red is prominent on this chart. So there's a lot of commodities manipulation. I don't necessarily mean any manipulation in a bad way. I mean, from a trading perspective, that, that the four banks control. They manipulate by putting their positions in the paper market prices of hog futures, oil, gold and silver, sugar, all that stuff in the commodities markets as well as all the other stuff. Now, I have a question for you and I'm gonna leave it rhetorical. If they're managing that, four banks are managing that for all of these different areas, could they not, because they have all this trading positional data being there's only four of them, could they not in some way affect what they're trading one market to make money in another? In other words, these are all intertwined. Interest rates, foreign exchange, equity and commodities aren't wholly separate, why? Commodities are determined, prices are determined by what? currencies, value of currencies. What's that? That's the foreign exchange market. Equities and the value of equities are also determined by interest rates on debt. They're determined by the prices of inputs to what they manufacture. They're determined by the relative value of the currencies there in which their uh, countries are domiciled and they trade in. Equities is determined by all those things. So as risk changes in these other markets, it affects each and every other one. In other words, it's all a bastardized version of things together. So you cannot say commodity risk is only commodity risk. Equity risk is only equity risk. No, there are companies that use commodities that happen to be equities, that happen to trade in foreign currencies, that happen to be exposed to interest rate risk. That's why they're all intertwined. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how four banks control all of these markets. See, it's in a chart from the office of the comptroller of the currency. All these astounding observations that you get and you just read the public information straight from the government. They're telling you how they move the markets. This is fucking how. It's, it's with the derivatives. Because why? This is what sets the pricing. This is a pricing chart. And this tells you how four banks dominate the entire fucking derivative complex. It's not just the metals, ladies and gentlemen. It's all of it. All of it dominated by who? I'm being very dramatic here on purpose. Dominated by JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citibank, and Goldman Sachs. Oh my goodness, it's not conspiracy theory. It's on the OCC report. Can you believe it? Let's go to figure 18. Here's where you get the precious metals. Blah, blah, blah. We're going to get through all this other stuff. Here's the one that sparked a bunch of interest on Twitter. What happened here? Can you see where one of these years, these are all years, one of these is not like the other. Which one would that be? Gee, it would be 2022, which would happen to be this year, which is not even over yet. And what is orange symbolic of? Well, according to the chart, precious metals. So the orange precious metal derivative exposures of those four big banks just went bonker nuts. Now, did it actually change? No. Why? Read this down here. Beginning January 1, 2022, this is the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. The largest banks, that would be the four that I just showed you, are required to calculate their derivative exposure amount for regulatory capital purposes using SACCR, Standardized Approach for CCR. Why did I show you CCR at the beginning? Because it explains to you why this is the money shot chart. I got to explain what it is before you understand the risk. Under the SACCR, gold derivatives right here 
are considered precious metal derivative contracts rather than an exchange rate derivative contract resulting in an increase in reported precious metals derivatives contracts compared to prior quarters. So if at any point in time prior to 2022, you looked at an OCC report and you thought you understood the derivative risk in the precious metals markets that the banks had, wrong, wrong, wrong. Any analyst who said they don't have a lot of risk in the precious metals market was full of shit because these were hidden. The precious metals were hidden in exchange rate. Why would they be hidden in exchange rate? Exchange rate is for what? Currencies. What are currencies? The dollar, the yuan, the pound, the yen, the loonie, and blob, the peso, the various versions of it. All of it. They were hiding gold and silver under the fucking foreign exchange currency risk so you didn't see it. And Basel requirement said you got to change it. Why? Why would they pull the metals, derivatives, numbers into their own category for the first time? Because it presents a, a pending clear and present danger to the balance sheets of the fucking banks. This is the admission that the metals derivatives will affect the solvency of the goddamn worldwide banking system, period, and a fucking story. And if anybody tells you different, it's in the OCC report right here. That's the only reason you separate that out. The only reason, because the whole point of the SACCR and Basel III and the OCC report is to measure solvency risk of the banks. The only reason, period, end of story. This is the money shot. I got more, but this is a money shot. It's proven that if they lose in the derivative markets for the precious metals, the four banks which dominate it, which is in the same report, if they lose, whether they're long or short, and then there's a run against them by the market, they're in deep shit. And it could cause the rest of the derivative complex to collapse. Why? Remember at the beginning of this presentation when I said 66% of the four largest banks, well, the whole banking system, but especially the four largest banks, collateral against default and derivatives, 200 trillion of them, 200 trillion. Their equity is in cash. What's happened to all the fiat currencies? They're burning. What's happened to all of the fiat currencies over the history of the world? They've all collapsed. What else? Bonds. What's happening in the bonds? Rising interest rates. Pressure on bonds. Okay. Too much debt. And other things like equities. What's happened to the equity markets? Every time the equity market loses a percent, it drops the derivative coverage by the banks by an equal amount of the equity derivatives that they hold. Do you understand now? As the markets begin to turn over and collapse and we head into the next recession, it affects the solvency of a $200 trillion worldwide derivative market that could blow the fuck up and take the banking system down with it and cause us, cause the detonation of the Western precious metals derivative markets in which you would then see gold and silver explode for a bunch of different reasons. One, because the derivative markets don't determine anymore, it becomes more to a physically traded market and whoever wants to sell it at whatever price they want to and not the speculators and the hedge funds and the bullion banks who've been massively shorting it. And we showed on the commitment chair report from the CFTC, I don't know, a hundred times over the last two years. Then the M1 and M2 money supply, which has exploded in 2020 to deal with the pandemic, had started to pull back in March, but by relatively modest amounts, according to all the Fed's charts and their data tables. In fact, the amount that's in circulation is still more than it was during the pandemic. OK, so even though there's a contraction, in the total top line numbers in M1 and M2, as we see here, the amount in circulation is still above where it was. So that doesn't explain the market pullback that actually started before. March when M1 and M2 began retracting. I did want to show this neat little chart. According to the Fed, when you take M2 over M1 in a ratio format, you can see that the amount of M2 to the amount of M1 had fallen, meaning M1 had been expanded by more than M2, right? So if you have one number over the top of the other and that ratio falls, that means the number on the bottom got bigger faster. So go back to M1. If we look at a chart 
which will include 2020 in it, you can see that there was basically a fourfold increase in M1. And if you look at M2, there was essentially not a fourfold increase. It went up from about almost 16 trillion to about 22. It's about six over 16, which reduces down to three over eight, about three eighths. So definitely this one multiplied by a factor of four, four X, this one went up by about three eighths. So M2 went up less than M1. And what that means is there's more M1 sloshing around, more of the super tight liquidity base than there was for M2. Now that's gonna be important here in a moment when I show you the effect of the reduced M2, because what did they do during the pandemic? They didn't increase savings accounts. Remember what M2 is. We go back to M2 and look at the explanation is savings deposits. So they didn't increase the savings deposits or the time deposits or the balance of money market funds, which would have benefited who? The savers in society. That's not what they increased as much. What they increased was the components of M1, which is currency outside the US Treasury, Federal Reserve banks and vaults, which could be held by anyone, demand deposits at commercial banks. Remember, commercial banks are the big guys. The savings are the little guys. So they didn't increase the little guy money as much as they increased the big guy money. Okay, that's key to understanding what's going on. So they gave the big guys money and watch what they did with it. Number three, other checkable deposits, so on and so forth. So what they did with M1 is they expanded that, which benefited the banks, commercial deposits, those types of entities before they expanded the money that eventually trickles out to you and me in savings deposits, time deposits, and money market funds, which is M2. And that's shown in this chart. M1 increased more than M2. That's why the ratio of M2 over M1 sharply fell because the denominator M1 got bigger a lot faster during the pandemic and M1 became more important in what is M1 it's the stuff that goes to the big dudes in society, whereas M2 goes to the small dudes, right? And that's not what increased as much as you can see here. All at the same time, keeping enough aggregates out that they didn't actually decrease, even though M2, I'm sorry, M1 and M2 both decreased. Okay, what does that mean? It means they made more credit available to the big guys in society to keep the economy going. They didn't make it available to you and me. We didn't get the bulk of it and they left enough out sloshing around in the system to where you wouldn't have a full retraction of M2 and M1. And since March, there has been a small retraction. We know why the Fed said they're going to tighten and that has caused the markets to crash. But again, the amount that they tightened, if you look at this table, there's still money sloshing around. The amount they tightened is relatively modest considering how much it had increased, right? Relatively modest considering how much it increased. A little slight downtick, but look at how much it went up. So to me, that's not, that's not the explanation that in March, they started retracting the money supply, even though the amount out circulation is still more than it was two years ago since the pandemic, that that has caused the big pullback and the big issue with bonds and stocks and in Bitcoin I, and the rest of the cryptos. I don't think it has. That's what people are saying. I don't see that evidence right now. It doesn't mean that that evidence won't manifest in the future. Well, here we got something really cool. And I think now we're starting to get onto something with this chart, okay? Now we're starting to get what's, what's the story? What's going on? Real M2 money stock, okay, what is that? That is essentially the M2 money stock. So it's this chart right here, M2 money, which includes, remember, saving deposit, time deposit, money market funds, plus all the commercial uh, accounts that are uh, considered with M1, okay? Divided by the CPI or deflated by the CPI. So this is inflation adjusted. So when you look at the M2 money stock, you've seen a downturn. And if we go on a short-term chart, a one-year chart, this is a much steeper line. So the real M2 money stock, when inflation adjusted is going down much further on a one-year chart. So this is the one-year chart on M2 money supply, which just started to track in March and by a modest amount. But if you look at it when adjusted for inflation, it's gone down by a lot more. So that means that even though the M2 money that was circulating around is still much greater than it was during the pandemic, the value of that money because of the money they printed is now starting to reduce. In other words, the Fed has now reached the Maginot line or the point of no return or the breaking point, if you will. And, and let me come off screen or come off the share to, to explain to you this may be one of the most important things I've ever broadcast on this channel. We've now reached the point at which the Fed can greatly expand the monetary supply, but now that inflation and prices is caught up with inflation of the money produced, 
the overall value of that money supply is measuring M2 has actually come down. It's not the fact that they severely restricted the M2 money supply. It's the fact that inflation and prices has caught up with that previous printing and has caused that to become less valuable. So every dollar that they have printed is now less valuable. And that's part of what's causing the system to break. Inflation has taken over. Inflation has taken over even the money that, or to a large portion of the money they printed during the pandemic. And it's not the fact that the central bank has retracted M1 and M2 money supply, because you can see in the aggregates, they're still flush. It's that inflation has eaten the value of it. And we're now at the point in the system in which every dollar that the Fed prints is going to have a declining effectiveness in the market because inflation has taken hold. So when they print a dollar, but the value of the M2 money stock falls faster than the dollar they print, that's where we're at in the Fed. And that's where we know we're at the end of this system because now the Fed can print all they want and you're gonna have a decreasing amount of effectiveness for each dollar printed. And again, I'm gonna go back to the screen and this may be one of the most important charts I have ever shown you on this channel. And I'm not being hyperbolic. Look at how much this is falling due to inflation. It's CPI right here. And we're only talking CPI, ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking real inflation. CPI, I've always said, 8.5, 8.3, whatever the current print is, is not real because of hedonic adjustments, geometric weighting, all the games that they've played. And if you go back to the 1980 way of calculating it, which ShadowStats does, ShadowStats.com, you can see our inflation rate is much more than 8%. It's more closer to 17 to 20%, depending on you know little tweaks there. So the inflation rate is so high that it's reducing the value of the available monetary aggregate in the system. 2.2 trillion held currency in circulation, 3.3 reserve balances. So we've now reached the point, again, most important thing I'm gonna say probably all year in this channel, we have reached the point at which the Fed cannot outprint the crash that's coming. Again, the Fed cannot outprint the crash that is coming. And it's not the fact that they've severely retracted M2 and M1, it's the fact that inflation is eating the value of M2 and M1. And that's the importance of this chart. We're on the opposite side of the point of no return from the Fed and from central bank policy, not only in the United States, ladies and gentlemen, across the world. Remember, they knew that they were going to dial it back. And we're talking about all the central banks listed here. Okay. It's not only happening in the United States, it's happening around the world. Inflation is raging around the world. And now all the central banks have flaccid, limp, an effective crap policy, no matter what they do. Because if they print now, each dollar will have less and less effect until it has a negative effect because it'll create more price inflation. And they can't retract because they're doing that now. And look at what's happening to the market. It's a very modest contraction in terms of interest rates and the way that the market is reacting. Here's the most stunning emission from that OCC report, which I'll show you in a minute. Two paragraphs, and I've got the stunning stuff highlighted in black, okay? And it just goes to show these complex systems we put together are based on a bunch of assumptions in which they don't really know the truth. And so they don't know if it's going to turn out the way in which they've designed the system to work. Because it's not governed by natural laws in which we can kind of figure out what they are, like physical laws and monetary laws, and kind of put together an approach of managing money. It's complex math and complex financial system put together by humans, which is vastly imperfect. And that is showing here in this admission from the OCC. They say, counterparty credit risk is a significant risk in bank derivative trading activities. The notional amount of a derivative contract is a reference amount that determines payments, blah, blah, blah. The credit risk is a derivative contract is a function of an, in a derivative contract is a function of a number of variables, such as whether counterparties exchange notional principal, the volatility of the underlying market factors. We talked about that before, all these risks and the maturity and liquidity of the contract and the credit worthiness of the counterparty. In other words, no guarantees. Credit risk and derivatives differs from credit risk and loans. Think of a traditional bank loan for a house or a car, for example, because of more uncertain nature of potential credit exposure, meaning there's another counterparty, not just the borrower, but the other bank issuing you the derivative or on the other side of the derivative. There's more risk, in other words, in the derivative market than there is in a traditional loan market. That's very key to understanding the real risk that could be exposed in the banks. Be reading further, because the credit exposure is a function of movements and market factors, banks do not know and can only estimate, emphasis, 
do not know and can only estimate how much the value of a derivative contract might be at various points in the future. So in other words, the entire gold and silver derivative market, the entire commodity derivative market, the entire interest rate derivative market, the entire derivative market over equities, all of the derivative markets cannot be known and no company or no regulatory agency or no rating agency can possibly tell you what any of those derivatives can be worth in the future because of all these moving market factors, which are determined by who, ladies and gentlemen, not just the banks, but by you and me based on our everyday economic activity and the economic activity of people outside of the United States as well, because all of these markets are tied together. So what they're saying here is, because a credit exposure is a function of movements and market factors, i.e. the people and the institutions participating globally, banks do not know and can only estimate Okay, cannot nail it down. They can only estimate with some level of, an, of unsureness how much the value of a contract might be at various points in the future. So if anybody tells you that they know that derivatives are marked to market and it's correct and they can predict to you what's going to happen at derivative market, uh -uh, can't happen. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency says that can't happen. Okay. Mm -hmm.